to set some context as to why we are having this webinar. NSRCell is IMB, IM Bangalore's incubator, uh, which works. And under NSRCell, uh, we have a vertical named Impact Orbit. Uh, Impact Orbit works with both for-profit and non-profit social impact ventures, uh, working in various sectors, for example, the tech-enabled space, as well as circular economy, rural entrepreneurship, to name a few. Uh, we are a part of the Circular Economy Program which has uh, been running since 2022. In the last two years, we have partnered with various organizations like Acumen and Perno Ricard India Foundation. And we have successfully incubated about 33 ventures in the climate and circular economy space. These, uh, in the last year, we have worked with Perno Ricard India Foundation and supported 20 ventures working in the alternate construction, alternate consumption, as well as waste management sectors. Uh, we are very excited to share that we will, we are currently preparing to start our second cohort in partnership with Perno Ricard India Foundation. Through this uh, incubation program, we aim to support 25 ventures over the next year. Uh, these ventures are mainly um, working, would mainly be from the sectors of climate smart agriculture with innovations like regenerative agriculture, precision agriculture, to name a few. Plastic circularity, like alternate packaging, plastic waste to energy, and um, sustainable sort of uh, plastic waste to products. Alternative, alternative materials like construction waste and textile waste, green tech startups in climate, environment, efficient energy, clean water, and clean air. For this incubation program, we have a certain criteria. We'll be taking questions at the end, so uh, I request you to please hold on till the end for any questions you might have. And if you think you will forget it, feel free to put it in the chat as well. Um, for the uh, venture criteria, we are looking at ventures that are registered for-profit enterprises, either registered as LLPs or private limiteds. They have to have been in operation for at least a year, have a demonstrated proof of concept and early revenue, early generating early revenue. Definitely, there has to be a sector alignment. In terms of what you can expect from this program, we... Uh, our, uh, we will definitely be providing clarity, uh, supporting you with clarity in value proposition and just uh, a, building a sustainable business model, alternate sources of funding, as well as fundraising readiness, impact metrics readiness and impact measurement, and any trying to facilitate any government partnerships that may be required from your end. In the last two years, we have had the pleasure of working with some brilliant innovations. Um, here are a few of the innovations uh, that we have worked with, a few of the NSR cell circular economy alumni. Uh, Goodgum, uh, a lot of you may be familiar with the work Goodgum does. It is India's first plastic free chewing gum. Without by Ashia is a very interesting venture based out of Pune. They work with MLPs to make uh, value added products like sunglasses as well as coasters out of those. Pad Care works in the space of recycling sanitary waste. Sunbird Straws is one of our agri ventures, which uh, they mainly work with agri waste, specifically coconut dried coconut leaves, and produce uh, sustainable straws, which I can assure you are much better than the paper straws that we find in abundance. Minimize works with um, lithium ion battery recycling, and Indic Initiatives is in the sector of using agri waste as well as used paper cups to make handcrafted paper. Applications are open and we are looking for uh, exciting and groundbreaking innovations to work with. Uh, the applications will be open till 31st July and we urge you to apply at the earliest. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at nsrcell.social at gmail.com. Moving on to, as you, as I mentioned, plastic circularity is one of the key uh, aspects that we will be focusing on with this cohort. Uh, we realized that uh, apart from beyond incubation, we also uh, try, it is a constant attempt at NSRCell to facilitate a platform, provide a platform for meaningful discussion uh, with multiple ecosystem stakeholders. Uh, 
Aligning, keeping in keeping this in mind, we have curated a panel of brilliant experts from this space. Before I hand it over to them, I would quickly like to introduce the panel for today. We have Mr. Umesh from uh, the Circulate Initiative. He has extensive work experience from Euromonitor International to Rabobank. He is currently the research director at the Circulate Initiative. He also has a special interest in uh, examining and studying the critical role of financing in fighting plastic pollution. Thank you so much, Umesh, for joining us. Uh, the Circulate Initiative is a no global nonprofit committed to solving the ocean pol plastic pollution and, and advancing an inclusive circular economy. We also have uh, Nihar, who is an uh, alumni from the circular economy cohort itself. She has extensive work experience in creating grassroots level impact. After gaining this experience, she co-founded Green Banana with her co-founders Mudit and Sridhar. Green Banana works in building completely waste-based alternatives to concrete, which are not just waste-based, but also cement-free, moldable, and made, made using a waterless curing process. Thank you so much, Nihar, for joining us today. And our moderator for the day is Mr. Vinod Chandramoli. He has past experience in organizations like Plum Health and Freshworks. Uh, in 2022, uh, with a commitment to conservation, he co-founded Mycelium Ecology. Mycelium Ecology is on a mission to develop community projects with the sole purpose of conserving biodiversity within the Western Ghats. Thank you so much, all three of you, for joining us. And we're looking forward to a very insightful discussion today. Thank you so much. That was a very precise introduction, Shriyam. I love it. And the, the drama of each of us turning on the camera as we were introducing, I think uh, that's, the, that's the fun of an online meeting. But uh, thank you for uh, moderate, I mean, in, um, involving me to moderate this session. Uh, first, I was a little taken aback by the fact that you're asking somebody from a SaaS and a technology world uh, to come in to moderate plastic circularity. I had to search up both the keywords because I'm on the consumer side. I have nothing to do with uh, saving the planet per se, like the other two uh, honored uh, panelists here. But the more I thought through it and the more I understood um, why this is being done and also some of those uh, folks you've been uh, looking at uh, are all mentees on, uh, on NSR cell, I realized how important of a topic this is. Uh, and uh, and I, I think that uh, there are two sides to the coin and I love that both the signs are here. One is the one on the ground fighting this out and uh, figuring all of this out, which is Nehar and her gang at uh, Green Banana. And then we've got Umesh on one side who is uh, looking at innovation, who's looking at, uh, I don't want to name him the VC because VCs have bad reps, but Umesh is the one who's um, behind the idea of financing, how do we do it? And uh, I've been, I've I've been reading up on Umesh's posts on the INC uh, and, and all of those. I think it's quite interesting to be able to do. So without further ado, I'm going to speak less and I'm going to try to channel the conversation uh, in a way that both Nihar and Umesh are able to add more value. But I want to start with uh, Nihar. Uh, by way of introduction, if you can begin by talking about your problem statement. Um, between the world of NGO you were in uh, for almost a decade and then building Green Banana. Uh, I think it will set the stage really well. Um, yeah, thanks, Vinod. I think, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So before I even like to, you know, I'd like to talk about what I'm doing and the whole problem statement. I'll just set the context first. I think the whole circularity topic that we keep talking about and plastic circularity that we keep talking about, it's very similar to the game Chinese Whisper, right? And um, it's multiple levels of unit seamless, mm. uh, seamlessly, apparently seamlessly working together, passing on the systems, the resources, the information from one unit to the other. So when we talk about circularity coming from the impact space, it starts from waste generation, to collection, to sorting, to transportation, to processing, and to consumption as well, right? So it's these units, independent units, which need to work together very seamlessly to make this happen. Mm. Um, 
that's the first thing right and in this unit itself there has to be a lot of alignment together because even if this one piece is out of place i don't think the circular model can run as it's supposed to and that's mm -hmm. that's in fact that is the ground reality that is happening right and that's the first thing that we understood that it's not one thing that we are out there to solve there are multiple levels and layers of problems that need to be deep dive in and need to be solved for have you not solved for everything right and none of have, none, none of us have solved for everything but this identification was the first thing so i think what i would say as a problem statement the first problem statement that we took was this that how do we create these unwritten sops for this game of chinese whisper to flow very nicely with each other for people to work together collaborate um a lot of conversation has happened around people who are working with waste on ground rag pickers right people who collect the waste have been segregating it but it's not enough a lot of people there are tempo walas for example right i'll keep switching between my language this tempo walas kachra kaise collect karna hai segregate karna hai humne sikha diya but mm -hmm. there are also people who are going to logistically manage this now the tempo yeah. wala does not know how to hold it load it unload it it these are the small unwritten sop so the first problem that i think we identified and really worked to solve was aligning the circular model in the first place second i think what shreem has also introduced for us it was also about how does this waste not become a waste or we don't become a waste management yep. organization and look at waste as a solution to solve a much larger problem sure. because till that does not happen the economic viability the sustainability of the system we might do it for a while as um a charity or donation or a system that is funded through charity right but for it to sustain on its own we keep talking about scale for it to scale on its own can that waste really solve a larger alignment issue and that's where we looked at resource consumption construction as one segment concrete a highest gag emitting material that we keep talking about can we really replace that was a second layer probably that we looked at and i think third very briefly um we what we wanted to also do it is uh, make it like i said commercially available commercially viable accessible right? right and that had to be done from design aspect yes you have to design the end product also very carefully curate it very carefully you have to design your machinery your capacity your availability in the same way a lot of things have to be innovated for that and the last bit becomes the supply and distribution because you're bringing a new material into place you there's a lot of awareness that has to be created like you said you know you 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 are a consumer and consumers have right to ask questions and we also started out even if we do know about what we are working on or the segment that we are working on there are a lot of gray areas that we need to ask questions about and solve for so just to introduce and set the context these three layers is what we identified as problem statements and began with love it love it so one is the the whole the production line of it then trying to see or either define it even if you're not solving for it right and then the second is the idea of uh, waste management but not in its true sense and then the third is the consumers and sort of the glamorization of it right how could you how could you make this a lot more impactful now um speaking about uh, the the funding and you mentioned that the system needs to be funded i'm going to look at umesh you you've been doing this for quite some time you're almost at the uh, tick of it with uh, and you, if people haven't gone you should go and read some of the data points which come out i feel like a, a lot of very interesting insights and i was really surprised to see india had 61% of recycle versus germany at such a less uh, they don't recycle as much but obviously the consumption and the production is a lot more but from where you stand umesh uh, uh, from across the world into india uh, what have you seen by way of introduction if you could double click on uh, how has the world changed how far are we behind maybe that will help us get started sure um first of all uh, thanks to the nsr cl team for having me here and and vinod for that wonderful introduction uh, thanks also to nihar for setting the stage 
Um, clarifications in order. First of all, uh, I work for a non-profit, not for a venture capitalist organization. Um, so that's first things first. Financing equates to venture capital in our world, at least the world I come from. So I love that you're correcting me. Thank you for yeah. that. Um, we do, however, uh, work closely with a mission-aligned investment partner organization called Circulate Capital, uh, mm -hmm. which has made several investments uh, in India. So as, as, as we go through the whole discussion today, I'll be referencing some of the investments they've made and the rationale for some of these investments as well. Um, then again, back to the problem statement and why we are here and what, and, and what we are trying to do with uh, the Circulate Initiative. I think if you go back to where plastics was uh, first started off in, and, and how it has been at least up until the early 2000s as well, it, it was always seen as a fantastic material. It continues to remain a fantastic material. There's so many positive properties, uh, applications and benefits. But we've take, come to a point in where it has actually become plastic being talked about as a crisis of a lifetime, much like climate and all the other pollution issues that we talk about. So with the Circulate Initiative, our work is actually much more um, as in a catalytic nature. Uh, so to make sure that entrepreneurs like Nihar or the other entrepreneurs working on in this space know how the resources, the knowledge, the data that they need to make sure that their business continues to grow and scale. Um, it is realistic, it is only realistic to understand that not all businesses will scale, but to make sure that whoever are um, fighting on this challenge have all the resources that they need to succeed. Now, that's the context. Now, comparing and contrasting. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the 60% recycling rate for India because, and and you contrasted it with Ger Germany. Uh, always take data, such as recycling rates with a pinch or sometimes even with a bucket full of salt. The reason why I say that is because when you talk about, uh, say, for example, 60% recycling rates, um, you have to start thinking about what's definitions. And I'm, I'm a research person at heart, so I keep coming back to definitions, coverage, scope, et cetera. Uh, a recycling rate of 60% is applicable to some of these materials which have higher recyclability. So, for example, if you look at materials like PET, which obviously gets picked up from the waste stream, uh, that has higher recyclability the moment you start talking about materials like films, which obviously your waste pickers don't really have the sort of desire to pick up return on investment or the return on their effort, so to say, is low. That has absolutely abysmal recycling rates, if any. And then if I start talking about multi-layer plastics, that's even lesser. So compare and contrast. Also, what is recycling? So in some of the more developed markets, um, material which is picked up and sent for incineration is considered and treated and defined as recycling. In a lot of the other markets, if actually the material doesn't go back to full circularity like uh, with plastics recycling, uh, it is not, right? So you don't have material coming back fully circular. So that's another definitional issue as well. Oftentimes, people confuse collection for recycling with recycling as well. Yeah. That is a big issue. Material that's, that is collected often doesn't necessarily mean that it would actually get recycled. So these are some of the important considerations. Um, India in general is, at least among emerging markets, is, is seen as a good shining light or a good example to follow. I think we have a very robust system, at least and thanks to the work that the informal waste pickers are doing of higher value material being collected and processed. Um, I think formal waste management systems, obviously the pressures that the municipalities face are always under pressure. Their funding is always a constraint because of competing priorities and that will continue to remain the case. But we have seen an influx, I wouldn't say an influx, but we have seen private investments coming through to support some of these entrepreneurs putting out solutions to tackle the issue. I see Nihar, you're moving and I and we know the screen is frozen, so I'm assuming the internet connection is not on my side. Yes, uh, I think we know the screen is stuck. Fair enough. Happy to hold. I'd just like to add, I mean, while sure. um, we know it gets back, right? Like you used a very exciting word or interesting word, return on uh, return on uh, collection. Yeah, I think there's one more element to this. There's also a return on segregation that happens at the rack picker level because there's so many different layers of plastic waste that are that is out there, or even waste that is out there, right? Even that becomes one of the factors that they're looking at in the recycling space. Absolutely. Yeah, hi Vinod, you're back. Hi, sorry, I don't know what happened. If it was on a live stage, I would have just gotten disappeared and come back again. But I feel like uh, I don't know what happened on this. But uh, I caught most of it. I could hear you, but uh, I think it was the internet on my side. 
but I love it. I love uh, the correction you made, but I also assume from the, it can't, uh, not that India is not uh, doing really well, but uh, it's very evident from the outside world um, that there is still a lot to be done, uh, right? And, uh, and there is still so much to go. I'm going to go shift back to Nihar. Uh, and uh, this, this question, uh, uh, you know, this theme comes from some of the startups I've been mentoring in the impact space. Um, and uh, for somebody who's come from textbook and playbook level, go to market and setting up an establishment for a tech startup, there aren't many playbooks and test books for uh, impact space itself, right? Like, to be honest, in the last two, three years, this has become a lot more. But in the last five to seven years, I have, it was a lot more on the NGO driven, garment body driven. There weren't many um, folks from, uh, from this generation to be able to look at it, right? And uh, I see that you have taken on this challenge and uh, for the last uh, four years, you've been running a green banana in a way that, uh, that you know, it, it, is, it is highlighted, it's got you where it is. What, what are some of the challenges you face on a daily basis, especially when it comes to uh, one of those three layers, uh, you, you spoke about all three layers in which you're focusing on, but either of those, like what are some of the challenges? How do you tackle them? If some, if maybe you could paint pictures with some anecdotes uh, for the founders in the group, in the audience, that'll be great. Um, yes, <laughs> we love talking about challenges. You know, very few times we get this opportunity to really talk about challenges. Otherwise, we all, all have to talk about the positives of it. But, um, okay, so... I'll just talk or probably touch upon the ground level things first, right? Um, first and foremost, that happens in this space. And like you said, there's no textbook, there's no playbook, but there are norms. It's not that there are no, no norms in place. There are no guidelines in place, right? Even though it's a new problem, there's a lot of work that has been done where it defines a certain format. And the yeah. first one, and the first challenge as well as a format that we had to really understand and go through was uh, the compliances, pollution control board compliances. When we mm -hmm. use waste as a resource, when we talk about recycling, there's already a bias ingrained that we are using more energy than it is required. There's a lot of washing that goes into it. Especially mm -hmm. when we're working around with plastic waste, right? And for us, it was a very different space. It was, we're not using water, we're not generating anything we're not using high energy or fuel but we still had to create a proper system we had to get the pollution control board licenses in place we had to get the epr licenses in place so that can become a ground level um problem a challenge mm -hmm. that we need to overcome but that challenge is also important if we want to scale in future if you're designing something for scale this is going to come in handy tomorrow because you've crossed that path. Instead of doing it to tomorrow, do it today head on. That was the first thing I think we faced or um, had to work and put a lot of effort towards. Um, the second bit came in the entire space where every time we talk about plastic, I think Umesh touched upon that plastic is collected, there is segregation that is happening. Certain kinds of plastic are being recycled. But when we talk about single layer, when we talk about mm. multi-layer, right? And normally when we talk about multi-layer, now I think people have this understanding that chips packet, my ataka packet, something that is lying around is multi-layer. What we need to understand is there are more than 50 types of MLPs. It's yeah. not just the chips ka packet or you know, plastic, different types of plastic working together is also an MLP. Different uh, products, different types of material together with plastic is also MLP. And today, working on the ground, we realized or we, we have worked with more than 50 types of just MLPs that yeah. are not even chips packet today, right? And each of them behaves differently. Each of them has a different uh, way of segregation, working, processing that we do receive in a lot of times. So understanding that, working with the versatile nature of waste it's not a standard when you get into recycling when you're working with something that is um, waste as a resource or a secondary material right it has gone through its own lifetime and it's coming back to you it's not like a standard process where you'll get a certain spec sheet with your raw material you know this is the spec sheet i've tested it out and it works excellently well if it doesn't work i'm going to get it back 
So it's a very different material, a lot of learnings. The learning curve is big when you're working with this waste. Industries themselves have more than more than 50, 60 types of just MLP that they're releasing, right? So mm. that becomes a second uh, ground level understanding challenge, learning curve that we all need to go through. And that's one reason also why um, all of these data points, like, you know, Umesh said is upper niche. You, you can't really believe it. A lot of times when say we say that there's pollution being generated, is it? it's also categorized in different phases. So that mm. become that becomes the second one. The third uh, process comes when we are talking about acceptance of a new material. Right now, you've done this. You figured it out. You've gone on the ground. You've got the things in process. Now you're you're facing the consumer. There's a lot of awareness that needs to be built out. They have questions. They have uh, uh, things they want to know. There's a lot of bias that we are fighting every day. Mm. There's uh, a lot of R&D that we at our level need to introduce, get it through and put forward in front of people when we're promoting or designing something that is used by a larger audience, right? And especially when it comes with the um, intent of impact. So people yeah. expect more. People, um, there's, there's higher responsibility when you're building something like this. Because when you're going in with the right intent of recycling something, you can't cause more uh, negative impact than you intended to. So I think I'll just define it into these three segments where the most ground level challenges come apart from other things that fall into place and you know you need to navigate across the chain. Love it. I'm going to stay with you for a second before I move to Umesh because I want to expand from where you left off on the ground level into the the scaling right like often um a problem statement like this is already a behemoth of a challenge right like you are working with garments you're working with um waste management you're you're thinking about supply you're thinking about demand but when you took on these challenges what sort of vision did you set in terms of growth in terms of skill in terms of success within the organization. What are those, can you, if you can help me define one or two goals you've set at the beginning, you've met, you haven't met, uh, that'll help. Okay, so um, how I would like to define it is in a little different way, right? When we started out, I think the first, the, the, the entire question of scale has become more important as we've started this whole uh, building the startup ecosystem in the country, right? We yeah. we. I come from a family of uh, job workers. I come from a family of people who owned businesses and they've had legacy businesses, family businesses. They never spoke about scale on day one. They spoke about doing the right business, getting the right customer, solving the right problem, and then taking it in an organic way when we want to mm -hmm. grow something, mm -hmm. right? So um, for us, we looked at scale in a very different way. It was not about how many geographies are we going to really um, address. It wasn't about how many uh, how many tons of waste are we going to really cater to in a year's time. For us, mm. scale was a very contextual thing when we started out. For us, it was just, okay, six months ka planning. Karte. Six months, mm. mein, let's solve for this. Let's create the right process, let's create the right foundation. Can we create a mix that we can test out and go in the market and talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Once we went through that six months process, then we went on to design something for two years because then we realized that this needs to be addressed for two years. And then now we are at that stage where we are looking at, again, I'll just divide it into three uh, verticals again, right? The first thing when you think of scale is let's scale the demand. Let's look the let's let's flip the entire chain instead of making it a push model where waste is coming into the economy. Let let the economy demand the waste being recycled. So we flipped the cycle for ourselves. We said let's scale the demand that we have, right? Move on to then scale our capacity, our processes, our team, and then move on to scale the entire supply chain and value chain that we are building. So we, what mm -hmm. we've built at a smaller level, can we now replicate it and increase the complexity of it at a current bit? 
right so we've looked at scale in a different way but like you rightly said it is a question that comes on and ultimately it talks about when are we really going to be able to touch the tip of the problem because we alone yeah. in this one segment can we really solve the larger mega issue of this so it's going to be a journey it's going to be a six to seven year journey as compared to probably a tech organization that scales up in three years and you know rapidly grows up but it's going to be a hockey stick scale where we have to spend some time building our roots our foundation for next two to three years and then replicating an sop that we've already built out so that's how we probably you know it's not an exact answer to how you uh probably no, no, I love the, expected I love the scale scale. Yeah, but yes, yeah. that's, Sorry, that's I, how I would see it. I love it. And I love the scale, the demand first. Let it be a, a pull, right, rather than a push. Uh, the, I come from the world of uh, insurance selling, and insurance is a uh, push selling, right? And uh, you've got to push it down somebody's throat, otherwise they won't do it. But with, the, with what you've been building, and if you're able to create that value, and there is demand because of that value, I think it's a great way. Now, um, Umesh, uh, from from Nihar's perspective, um, that foundation is very strong for the hockey stick to bring. From where you stand and from where your ecosystem stands on financing and on innovation, uh, do we have enough time for building foundations or are we at a red flag level? Uh, and the second question maybe is, do, do people who are financing or creating grants or giving out grants think scale at the same way as Nihar does? Great question. Actually, um, even before that, I'll take a step back to just explain innovation sure. in the context of um, driving a circular economy for plastics. So sure. if you look at the whole gamut of solutions which are coming through, or which have been coming through for the longest time, actually, for the past 10, 15, 20 years, as I would say it. So you have innovations coming through really what I call as upstream. So that is replacing the materials. So some of the examples which you just uh, shared earlier in Shriam's presentation, you're completely trying to sort of um, avoid the use of plastic through other materials. Then you have innovations which come through in the midstream part of the value chain. So these are innovations which involve some form of consumer contribution or some form of consumer involvement, typically refill and reuse solutions. Uh, which mm -hmm. which actually involve consumer participation. And the last mm -hmm. part of that value chain is innovation when it comes to refill, uh, sorry, recycling, recovery and recycling. So essentially, after the material has been used, and then mm -hmm. as 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 it becomes waste, as we define it. Now, is there enough time? Are we getting enough solutions? And is there solutions to scale? Um, you have to look at each of these parts of the value chain and the solutions that are available in each part of the value chain as seeing relatively different levels of maturity and even within that different levels of maturity in different countries right so in, in markets where even the basic waste management systems are not in place some of these very mm -hmm. uh, low income economies the need is not for solutions to scale the need is to have basic waste management infrastructure you have to address the problems and the legacy waste and plastic and all of that that's been built up you need solutions for that right yeah. At the same time, you also need solutions to make sure that five years down, 10 years down, 15 years down, you're not tackling the same problem. Mm -hmm. So there is there is a there is a time pressure and there will be a continued time pressure because in general, consumption of plastics, production and consumption of plastics, unless otherwise something changes significantly, is not going to reduce. Right. So you have to make sure that we solve that problem and at the same time continuously innovate on solutions which will reduce the scale of the problem that we are facing now. Makes so that's sense. an overall context with respect to what we see with respect to the solution. Now on a funding side, what we have seen is that the more mature the solutions are, right? From an input putting the investor hat on, the more mature the solutions are, the the the, the fact that you can showcase profitability you're likely to receive investment. Now, as mm. you can imagine, obviously waste management is not the most attractive of sectors to begin with, right? People yeah. just don't look at it. Now, even yeah. within the whole ESG, sustainability, invest, impact investment space, again, not the poster child. You probably go for investments on the climate side of things. And if you look at Absolutely. even within that or, or slightly stretch that boundaries, 
a tech-oriented solution. So a waste management company who positions themselves as a tech solution is likely to receive, has a probability of receiving capital faster and quicker and maybe even slightly bigger ticket sizes when compared to a traditional waste management company. So that's yeah. where we stand with respect to how and where capital flows happen. But I, I did want to again reinforce a few things here. I mean, these things take time, right? Mm. Um, and I was, I, I, we had this sort of case study around Mexico and how recycling in Mexico to see the scale that it's happening now took almost 20 years. And that's big. Mm. And it, there was a confluence of certain things which happened. You had producers who came together and said, hey, we have a problem we need to solve. We had policies which came in and put mandatory pressure on producers, on consumers, on the whole ecosystem to act. Then we had financing through the form of incentives, which supported as well. So I know Nihar uh, talked about collaboration at the, at the very beginning of her when she was explaining the problem statement. And it's the same, right? There's no point if you to put money into a recycling infrastructure if you don't have whatever needs to precede that. So no point absolutely putting money into recycling if you don't have the collection infrastructure. So those that that is sort of a gist of where we stand with respect to investing uh, in, in, yeah. in solutions that drive a circular economy for plastics. Um, we have seen, we track investments, we track private investments in this space. Um, we have a free to access tool called Plastic Circularity Investment Tracker. We've tracked yeah. for India about um, 700 million in capital flows, investment flows between 2018 and the first six months of 2023. Uh, no surprises, over 90% of that money actually went to recycling and recovery. And within that one single transaction, which happened a few years ago, which was um, Ranki Waste Management Services, which was bought by KKR, was the single biggest mm -hmm. transaction. And that's because yeah. it's a well-established company. There's a clear profit model, which is there. Uh, the risk element comparatively is low. So the investor feels a lot more uh, comfortable. But the good yes. news, at least for entrepreneurs who are working on this challenge in India, is what we've also seen the other sides of the spectrum. So the midstream, the upstream. We see yeah. a lot more um, capital flows, venture capital flows on the part of the value chain as well uh, in India when compared to other emerging markets. So that's, like I said, I said India is like a sort of a shining light in this whole, and, and I don't want to paint a doom and gloom picture, but India is sort of a shining light because I think generally policies are slightly more advanced. I think yeah. there's a lot more understanding, especially of the recycling management uh, systems, recovery management systems, and the strong informal waste uh, work, waste picker chain that we have in the country. So yeah. that's, that's, that's that's where we stand with respect to innovation and scale of innovation and funding for innovation. Thank you, Mish. And I also noticed from the report that India has got a lot more powerful downstream policies uh, compared to others as well, right? And that's sort of uh, like you were talking about the debt. So in, uh, in uh, the technology world, we call it the tech debt, which is mm -hmm. catching up to competition. You've got so much to sort of relatively close. I think we have a lot of debt to be able to close uh, that given how much we have out there. There are a bunch of questions. I'm going to try to bring one up uh, for Nihar. This is maybe um, is some uh, Abhishek Gore, Gorele had asked, are there any important, uh, I mean, how important is innovation and in waste sorting? And the reason why I'm bringing you, uh, Nihar, is you spoke about first layer of SOP where some of this need to be done. Are you seeing any innovation? How important is waste sorting? Maybe if you could talk a little bit about that. You're on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think I would also like Umesh to probably chip in yeah. if you like. Sure. But you know, when it comes to when I talk about the waste ecosystem or the entire circular economy, right? Waste segregation at a generator level. I am the waste generator, right? Segregation at my level, collection, and then the sorting and segregation after being collected, right? Is a very important foundation of anything that follows right after. So that's mm. the number one fundamental need of anyone who's going to get into using the waste as a resource tomorrow, right? Because this did not exist at a larger level, the recycling, the processing and the consumption came in much later. But this was a sector that was looked at in the most, or I would call it a lot of startups 
began by looking and exploring this segment because it was that important. Yeah. Right. And um, there have been a lot of um, good innovations in the waste sorting system as well. Waste collection, waste sorting. Um, in spite of that, in fact, there have been good startups as part of NSR cell uh, cohort as well, who've been looking at waste sorting, automating waste sorting, right? Te bringing in technology innovations there. Yeah. Having said that, it still is at a primarily level where, like I said, we understand waste as MLP equal to chips ka packet, right? But we still <clears throat> need to deep dive further when, it, when we're talking about waste sorting ecosystem, waste sorting systems. If we can align, like the question asked, is there a need? Yes, there's a need which goes a step further from what has been already done in the automation space, right? Mm. If we can get that, uh, that level done, plus even if there is something that is out there when, when it comes to segregation, I think it is still not completely automated. Most of the smaller places. So I'm operating the organization from a place called Anand in Gujarat, which is a small town, right? You will not see waste sorting systems, segregation systems, automated systems in place there. So the penetration is still missing. And mm. just closing on to one line here, like, Umesh, you said that uh, waste um, overall, I think what is really happening is the waste penetration, the innovation penetration is something that needs to be scaled. The know-how is funded better than the operational know-how. So once we start paying more attention to the operational know-how also as an IP, I think that is what the ecosystem overall also needs. So just two bits there. Uh, Umesh, please do add in this yeah, question. Umesh, not anything. Please yeah, do think... add. And also maybe Shirag has been waiting to get that. What is MLP category? What are those 50 counts? Maybe if you could double click on a what what other uh, categories within MLP uh, that are interesting, especially from India's perspective, that'll be good. I, I quickly um, intervene and comment on waste sorting and then I'll let Neha talk about MLP. Um, I think you have to look at the overall market dynamics um, in emerging markets like India. Um, you have to look at the cost of investment, what works uh, in, in a market like India. I mean, or may not work in other developed markets. So in this case of waste sorting, in most lines, as you may call it, it's human sorting. I think people look, feel, and most workers who work in these facilities have a really good eye for the material, right? They pick up. So if you are, or if anyone is thinking of a waste sorting line or segregation line, please make sure that it works with the current system where you already have hand sorting which takes place and what is the value accretion that this waste sorting brings in addition to having people. If not, then obviously there's no value addition, then there is no value. And it's again, going back to the whole investment scale up story, if you don't have that story to sell, then obviously unlikely that uh, the cash flow would come to, or the investments would come to. Nihar, I'll, I'll let you feed back on the uh, MLP types right. that uh, you're experiencing. Yeah, so I think, Chiral, you'll have to come and spend a day with me to understand the 50 types of MLPs. Uh, but uh, just to give you a context, there are different grades of plastic that are already defined, right? And the mm -hmm. biggest, there's a category called others, which is called the category seven. Now, a lot of the plastic categories which cannot be defined fall under this others, Right. And even today, I don't think, at least I'm not aware, right? I only have operational know-how of how things work. At least I am not aware of how many different subcategories the others plastic category has today. But just to for you to imagine the MLPs that I'm talking about, there is cloth and plastic together. The paper cup that we use, it's paper and plastic together. There are if I name seven different kinds of, if I'm talking about seven different types of plastic, category one, category two together, any category combination forms an MLP. And each category has a different property and they behave very differently. So when they're fused together or when they're working together, when they're even attached together, it becomes a different process to deal with them. Right. So I'll not name all the 50 categories that I would invite. I think Chirak to spend a day with us and go around and probably explore. But 
just for clarity, these are the things that we look around and experience when we're working in the space. Love it. All right. So I hope Chirag grabs that invitation and understands it. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Arun Vijayan's question and maybe between both of you, but Umesh, maybe I'll start with you. Um, I think uh, I'm going to read it. If I understand it correctly, plastics are made uh, bioproducts from fossil fuels and plastics are mostly subsidized as you pay for fuel. Uh, so when the electrical vehicle becomes popular, 30% by 2030, the need for diesel petrol comes down. What happens to plastic availability and price then? How is it going to affect our use of plastic? Have you seen any forward looking statements on this? Are there any um, from where you stand, are there any answers you have, uh, Umesh? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, like you mentioned before, the current statistics and projections for plastic production and consumption are only expected to increase. Yeah. Um, if you look at investments on the petrochemical side with respect to plastic production, that is also projected to grow, right? So that's why I said we need to find solutions for um, the problems of yesterday while discovering what are sort of those innovations that can help solve the problems, ongoing problems and the problems of tomorrow. The, and, and I keep saying this in, in, in any sort of conversation I have, the only way we're going to get sort of even close to sort of tipping away the toppest prop challenge with respect to plastic pollution is to reduce consumption. The only way to do this is to say no, right? You don't, you, you there is material that you need and I'm not against that, but there are materials you can easily say no to. There is a lot of stuff, whether it be refill we use, whether it be avoiding that plastic baggage you really don't need or any of those very simple solutions which we as consumers can do. Simple things. I mean, segregation law has been in India for the longest time and in cities and we all need to do it. it recycling is not necessarily a 100% solution, but it is a solution which will work to a large part. Please make sure that that works well. So that's what I would say. I mean, I'd definitely say that regardless of what EV vehicles come through on board and potentially petrochemical industry facing challenges, the current projections are that plastic production and consumption are expected to increase. Uh, plus the price competitiveness of pl plastic vis-a-vis -vis all other materials. And I draw this parallel always. I, I used to be in a bank and we, I used to closely look at the consumer food space mm -hmm. and we had all plant protein coming through. And everybody was talking about plant protein being the next big thing. And I compare that with animal protein and industry, which has been around for 1500 years. And if they had fine-tuned the cost mechanics so much, that is so difficult to compete on a pricing level. So pricing will still remain competitive down the road as well, regardless of what happens with, say, internal combustion engines and EV vehicles and so on. Got it. Got it. So I've got two questions which seem to overlap, at least from my judgment. I'm going to try to club them together. One is from Jyoti, where Jyoti is asking, is India still producing new plastic products? I think Umeshu dwelled upon it. If yes, what are the norms from the government? Uh, does the new production of plastic affect companies which recycle the plastic? Uh, versus somebody, I think uh, uh, Ajit had asked, mm -hmm. I'm an ECG advisor on boards. Are corporates and businesses doing adequate on plastic support, circularity support? What are the low hanging fruits? Maybe Umesh, you could jump in and then Nihar, if you've got any thoughts, you could, are, are, are we penalizing them enough? Are, do they even know uh, that there is data because there's a lot of the climate data around uh, of offsetting and all of that, but here are there enough being done? Right. Um, is India still producing plastic products? Like I said, it is. Uh, does the new production of plastic affect companies which recycle the plastic? Absolutely, it does. Right. I mean, that it 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 on a pricing level, uh, the price of um, recycled plastics and virgin plastics are not decoupled. So if you really go to the market and ask for recycled plastic price, it closely correlates with what's the price of virgin plastic. That is a given. Um, so that was the question. What's sorry, uh, we know if you could bring. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Ajit's uh, asking: Are corporates and businesses doing okay. adequate on plastic circularity support? Are they aware? What is the awareness? And what are low-hanging fruits? So I think you have to distinguish between different sets and of companies. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but recently there are some companies who've had to revisit their targets with respect to. Uh, recyclability of material, recycling rates, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are targets which have been set, companies are trying to do, but at the same time, I don't think uh, there is enough being done and there could be more which is being done. But 
eventually I will bring back and I and sometimes I hate the word collaboration, but that is what it eventually is, right? It, it is companies will put material out there. Um, we have to make sure that we work with our wallet. If we don't buy the material which is put out there in a certain kind of packaging, it is likely that they will shift and they'll be forced to shift as well. I don't know if penalizing is the right answer. Uh, I, mm. I think it has its own pros and cons, and I and I, I don't want to evil say uh, victimize plastic and say it's the evil material. It is not. I mean, there's so many fantastic properties, uh, food grade properties. We just don't have a re replacement. And um, it happened with the ozone layer and, and the regulation around the ozone layer, and I don't want that happening again, which is a regrettable substitution. We realized that, oh, we've completely faced it. Let's say 50 years down, we realized that we've completely replaced plastic and we have a completely new material. And on certain indicators, it actually is worse than plastic. That's a situation we exactly want to avoid as well. So what are those low-hanging fruits with respect to where plastics can be avoided, replaced? What are those where it cannot be and it will continue to be? So medical applications are some of those where we'll continue to need it. There's no doubt about it. But there are others where we don't necessarily need. I mean, I, I live out, I live in Singapore and I've, seen, and I've been to Korea and I've seen a banana, a single piece of banana actually being wrapped in polythene. I, I'm like, why? Why would you yeah. want to do that? I oh, the argument, yeah. Yeah, I've had the argument about cucumber and, and the shelf life of another four to five days that you get for cucumber, which is wrapped. I'm like, okay, I get that, but is really is it really needed? So there are those where you can actually have avoidable plastics, avoidable single-use plastics in particular. There are others where you continue to need plastics because of the valuable properties that it brings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one question, maybe Nihar, uh, adding on to it, is uh, two. There are two questions both you can take. One you've already seem to have answered, which is from Satish. What are the biggest challenges in plastic waste collection? Uh, and then Babulal is asking, do you think a lot of recycling infrastructure can solve plastic pollution problem? Uh, if yes, how do you think demand for recycled content will compete with virgin plastic material? Right uh, in your field there, uh, Nihar. Maybe you could take this as one uh, one answer together. You're on mute. Yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> uh, okay. So, one, I think a lot. So, this is a very common question that comes a lot of times. Just because a recycling solution exists. And I think I'm just going to second what Umesh said uh, a while back, that a single recycling solution is one, not the ultimate answer to the entire problem, right? It's one yeah. part of the larger umbrella. There are alternative materials that are out there. there there's massive reduction in consumption that we have as a choice that we can do, right? And uh, in terms of... Uh, Recycling as a solution, it is going to be a solution for, again, what Umesh said, a lot of areas where we cannot replace a material like this, right? The consumption has will or might continue. So while it does continue, we will continue needing these solutions that are in place. But that in no way is a response to, you know, there is a solution out there. There is a way we can handle this. And let's just continue doing and consuming at the scale that we are. Second, I think what um, interestingly there was, so I'm just touching upon this waste segregation collection challenges point. There was a case study that was done in Japan and it's um, on the waste bin, the way they design their waste collection bin. So they had a very uh, nicely smart bin designed for waste collection and they kept it there in the public space and thought, you know, people would put out the waste and it'll be segregated. What they realized was uh, it completely failed. It completely failed as a system and as a solution. They did their second trial where they placed a transparent uh, dustbin in the public space. And they suddenly realized it works, right? And this is what they call as a shikake concept. There's a very interesting book on this where they said that because people were so conscious that if I'm going to put the wrong waste in the bin, there are other people who will be able to actually un see that I've done the wrong thing socially, people started segregating it. So we didn't need advanced, smart solutions to solve the segregation collection problems. All it needed was a very smart behavioral solution to sure. probably 
move that change across, right? So um, collection, the biggest problem, I think, in the collection, just one last thing, waste is no one's problem. The biggest problem in this segment is that waste is your problem. The industries don't think it's their problem. I, as a consumer, don't think it's my problem. I, as a generator, don't think or um, of, of waste, don't think it's my problem. And the biggest, um, what we would love to call, right? Bahar kachra lene aane, kachra wala aata hai and we say kachra wala aya hai. But yeah. kachre wale to hum hai. We are the ones generating it. That's the safai wala. So till we don't have this basic understanding, whatever unit of circular ecosystem, recycling, consumption we talk about, I don't think we are going to really, you know, um, adopt and solve the challenges that we keep talking about. So that first understanding is very important. Well said, well said. Yeah. Uh, I think Chirag also brings back uh, Umesh or maybe Nihar, if you could jump in, is uh, how can one find jobs in this sector there are no certifications and uh, and i think there are a lot of questions on how do we read up on it what are how do we understand so maybe chirag who are some players in this field who people can look up to obviously the circulate initiative is one of them but other than that how do you keep up on tab what are some important papers you could read places you could visit things like that please chirag sure. Umesh. i mean like i said at the be beginning of the call um our our goal and our reason for existence is to sort of support entrepreneurs and others who are working on a shared uh, challenge. Um, we mm -hmm. publish and several resources, uh, with, but if you're starting at a very basic level, like somebody asked about uh, education and basic courses, um, UNSCAP has a close, clo um, I think closing the loop course, uh, which I found very beneficial. It is very basic, but it gives you a nice structured approach to understanding the challenge, the solutions and so on. As you go along, there are a lot more free to access resources. Uh, so we publish and we have a very specific interest um, with respect to understanding the climate and plastics connection, also understanding um, the financing side of things. So these are two topics that we write and, and discuss a lot about. Um, there are other resources, uh, but uh, again, basic. we've done some very basic work on a slightly more complicated concepts. I saw a question about uh, plastic grids. We've done some work there on refill and reuse, EPR, and so on. Um, there are other nonprofit organizations as well with similar resources. Um, also, uh, you reference the global plastics treaty negotiations, and, and that's colloquial. The official language around that is international legally binding for plastic, for instrument on plastic pollution, which is a mouthful. But there's a lot more resources, and the reason why I brought it up is because there's a lot more resources coming on stream, because there's discussions around having an agreement like the climate agreement. So if we have that and if people are reading up there's a lot more resources the unscap course is something which is very fundamental and basic which i would encourage everyone to read and then you can go into organizations such as ours uh, there's a world wildlife fund wwf who publishes on a regular basis uh, such information as well and i'm sure there are resources in, in, in specific to india as well which is available love it okay all right so we are right on time uh, and I've got a lot of questions, which I'm hoping we're able to probably type and reply to people. But uh, one question from Shravan is a great way to end. What is the future of circular economy? What is the utopia world you believe in? Umesh, and then we'll end it with Nihar, painting the picture on what is the future of circular economy from both your perspectives. Right. I mean, for me, it's very straightforward, which is... Um... And I, I, I keep referencing this. It is, it is not to say that uh, we should stop plastic production. It's not realistic and it's not achievable mm. and it's not necessary. However, mm. what we need to fix is the leakage of plastic in whatever form it is to the environment. That is what we need to address. I don't think any of us want to see plastic blocking our water bodies. I don't, want to, I don't think anybody wants to see plastic in our oceans or rivers when you go for a swim. The Or... As we don't realize, we, we burn it and then we suddenly think that, okay, the problem is gone. It is not. All of that stays in the environment. So in my utopian world, God knows how long it will take for it to be achieved. What I wish for is to make sure that plastic does not end up in the environment. No leakage to the environment, whatever it's hope. If we are producing it, we are responsible for it as well. Yeah. Nihar, from where you stand, what's the future of uh, circular economy? 
and plastic circularity, as NSR cell would like to call it. So, so I'll I'll come to that. I just had this hanging point from the previous question that I just wanted to bring about. Um, I wanted to draw a parallel to the impact sector in general, right? Like a lot of people do come and ask, how can I work in the impact sector? I'm an engineer, I'm a scientist and this. So when we talk sure. about a specific field, even sustainability per se, we do need people who come from different backgrounds. Just because we're doing something in the recycling space or the impact space does not mean we don't need expertise of someone from finance background to come and make this happen. Doesn't mean we don't need someone from the sales expertise to come and make this happen. Because like I said, it's a very dynamic um, ecosystem. We need people from different functions. So even if you do not have a specific degree in the space, do come and start with internships, working with organizations in this space. And second, I would like to give a shout out to uh, Sustainability Mafia as well. They do post jobs in this space. So you can reach out and understand what different opportunities are coming. Um, now coming to the whole closure of what you asked, you, the utopia. I don't know about the utopia, but there was a very interesting quote in Times of India today by Tichnath Nan, where he talks about how we as people normally cut reality into compartments, right? And so we are unable to see the interdependence of phenomena happening. So to me, I think the utopia is the day the entire circular chain, we are looking at it from a larger perspective. We are able to have, I come back to collaboration, where we identify each of us in the space, identify our core identify the value proposition that we can bring into the circular ecosystem space. And each chain can work, contribute, and let it go like a wheel. Can we let it go like a wheel? Can we keep flowing forward, right? Working together and collaborating in this space. The day we achieve that, I think that is a realistic uto utopia for us to set our milestone with and then probably keep setting new utopias as we keep hosting panels and keep talking to each other and setting new narratives here. Okay, love it, love it. And uh, I think for me, the biggest takeaway is the fact that plastic is not the villain here. Uh, and uh, and uh, one of the things which you said, Nihar, which I think I'm gonna resonate with is in every step of the way, let the let the end production point be the biggest quality driver. Uh, and if you can solve gaps in each individual layers, then you don't need to worry about the demand or the supply because it automatically fills in. I think that's a that's a great uh, that's another great lesson. And I think uh, Umesh, um, the the fact that India is a shining light. Uh, I've been an extreme pessimist to this as a consumer, as somebody who sees plastic everywhere. But I also know that it doesn't it doesn't mean that all things are bad. And I think there are enough and more being done here. Um, there are almost a lot more questions here. I wish we had all the time in the world, but all of us are uh, green warriors and we have to go back to solving this. So I'm going to find a way maybe um, I don't know, Shriyam, if there is a way we could get these answers as part of the recording and then Umesh and Nihar can uh, reply to it and we can post it up along with the recording. I think that will be great. Yes, yes. I think we can do something about it. Perfect. All right. Yeah, Shriyam, back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vinod, for anchoring such a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Nihar and Umesh, for um, just brilliant insights. I think... Uh, we came into the webinar, I think at least personally, we came into the webinar thinking that we will learn a little bit about plastic circularity and in the current context. But Vinod, you have led the conversation in such a brilliant direction that we are also walking away with like a repository of um, knowledge repository and lots of homework to work on uh, to learn more about the space. Um, thank you so much for the value you brought in terms of this conversation. I think um, some of the key takeaways uh, uh, I think, Nehar, you mentioned uh, something about working with the versatile nature of waste. And um, that is something I will go back to constantly. And yes, Umesh, as you rightly pointed out, um, it needs multiple stakeholders collaborating uh, in multiple aspects to actually bring together a larger macro level change. And we hope to uh, support uh, organizations working in this space, innov uh, innovating in this space 
and over the next year. And just to quickly, before I close, just put uh, up the link again for the application to the incubation program. Um, you can all please go ahead and apply if you are innovating in the sector. My colleague has posted the link, application link in the chat. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, both related to this webinar as well as related to the larger incubation program in general. Um, Thank you so much once again, panelists. It has been wonderful. Uh, this conversation has been absolutely brilliant. And thank you everyone for joining in and logging in for this conversation. Um, I will collate the questions and see how we can sort of work around in terms of answering them and uh, uh, along with the recording once we put it up. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mish. Thank you, Nihar. Thanks, thank you, thank bye -bye. you for weaving it together so beautifully. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.